Hello there. I'd like to talk to you about what I call the face of ethnic cleansing. I could have said the facts, but the face is what is needed because it's about people. It's yes, the people are facts, but it's about people, ethnic cleansing. And the sad facts about normal ethnic cleansing is that when a population has been moved against its will, Everybody at the end of the conflict does not go back. About two thirds of them stay where they've gone. And I guess this will be true for Ukraine as much for any other place. Why do they stay away? They're scared. They don't trust their neighbors. Everything they knew is broken or burnt. People they knew are dead. The fact is that ethnic cleansing has happened throughout history and it's happening right now in our world. So I guess the place where I mostly saw ethnic cleansing was in Bosnia and the effects of it in Bosnia during the war. And one night my partner and I were driving from Garage Day up to Sarajevo for a meeting the next morning. It wasn't so late, it was maybe nine, ten o'clock when we were passing through halfway between Garage Day and Sarajevo in the vicinity of a town called Rogatica, which had a very bad reputation during the war. And we saw in front of us a truck, which is most unusual to see any traffic on that road. And as we got close to the truck, we could see that it had a canvas hood over the back. And in the back, we could see faces. And one particular face was an old woman with a headscarf just looking out the back blankly. And I said to my companion who was driving at the time, what's that? And he is a lugubrious, as it happens, Ukrainian. And he said to me, that, my friend, is the face of ethnic cleansing. Very shortly after that, the truck turned off to the right and we carried on towards Sarajevo. So, in this first slide that I want to show you, I've got a picture taken in daylight and it's taken in Syria. But the sense that it conveys is absolutely the sense of that night. People in the back of a truck, this one has no cover, but it could, as you can see, could have a plastic tarpaulin thrown over it very easily. And faces looking out from the back of the truck going somewhere. Now, whether they're internally displaced within their country or crossing a border which makes them refugees and international law makes a difference between inter internally displaced and refugees, although their actual physical conditions are exactly the same. When a poor person has left what few possessions they have, what few bits of livestock they have, some chickens, maybe a sheep or two, when they have nothing, they have nothing. So whether they're, you call them internally displaced or refugees, <laughs> to a certain extent is just a matter of semantics. So these poor people in this truck with a few worldly possessions are in Syria, but they could as easily be anywhere else in the world. They're leaving where they know and they're going somewhere else. And 60% of them, approximately 66% of them, will stay somewhere else in a camp with relatives, in a new life, whatever. They will not go back. In this photograph, we have what remains. And if you thought it was sad for the people running away, then you should visit sometime with the people who stay. Who are the people who stay? People who say, I don't care if they kill me, I'm staying. This is my home. My people are all buried over there in that graveyard. Why should I run away? They're mostly old people who stay because they understand very well that what is a new life for someone who's approaching the end of their natural life? So, they don't want to run away. And yet, if we look at this lady in this picture, can she stay? She has to get a neighbor who's got a horse-drawn cart to take her to do some shopping. When they can, neighbors will generally help out. But gradually, as they become more infirm and more incapable, they slowly become more and more tragic figures. That's the face also of ethnic cleansing because all around her have been cleansed. 
all the things that make her life a real life had been cleansed, she probably told her younger people to go. She probably did. Because for them, they can make a new life and they probably won't come back for her. Even in the peace, if they come back, it's just a visit. It's not to take her with them because if she refused to go in wartime, you can be pretty sure she'll refuse to go in peacetime. So she didn't go and in a way she can't stay, but she's stuck. She's there. So now if we look a little bit at the Kinevin framework and what it means with respect to this, I've said that 60% never return um, and that those who stay have a miserable existence. What is interesting about ethnic cleansing or interesting, uh, interesting issue, the key people movers, United Nations High Commission for Refugees, massive people mover, um, in International Order of Migration, massive mover, International Committee of the Red Cross, very humanitarian, they will have nothing to do with the negotiations that go into people leaving their villages. And this, by the way, ethnic cleansing is not running away in the middle of the night as the front line is erupting in fire. That is one thing. It's normally done in the days after the front line has moved and the people who are fighting you have taken over your territory, your land, your village, whatever. Um, and there's always negotiations about whether they will be allowed to go to a place of sanctuary internally displaced or as refugees because those who have them use them as counters as, as bits of capital to be negotiated well all these great humanitarians they don't take part in those negotiations they stand above that but what they will do if someone who is prepared to get their hands dirty if someone is prepared to sit at the table with the cleansers and the cleansed on either side of the table and make some kind of deal with them once the deal is made and once the people will move, well, they will provide the transport. They will provide the, they will provide the mode of getting from A to B, but they don't want their hands dirty. They don't want their hands bloody. They will claim that their terms of reference forbid them from doing it. They will say those political types who organize, facilitate the ethnic cleansing of people are breaking international humanitarian law. I would like to say to them that it's as inhuman not to help old people run away as it is to help old people run away. I would say to them that many other things come from those negotiations which help control and constrain somewhat the conflict. However, this is not recognized in international humanitarian law at the moment. It's a thing that needs to be looked at. So in the complex domain, I've talked about the uh, big picture. I've talked about the other bits and pieces. What I will tell you now in some sort of mitigation for those big organizations that move tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people in a year from different conflicts, if you added up all the people they help move, um, is that they are terrified of the chaotic. They're terrified of the collapse of, an, of a, an arrangement into chaos because invariably there will be a horrible bloody ending. You don't take old people back if they've started off and then the deal has fallen through elsewhere. You shoot them and leave the bodies on the side of the road. And that has happened in every conflict that I'm aware of at some time or another. And so it is true that those who get their hands dirty and go in and make the deals live with the possible nightmare of being an accomplice to the chaotic event, which was not planned, but came about normally from completely external circumstances, but it comes about. So you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. And really, to be honest, that's all I want to say right now about the face of ethnic cleansing.